Hi, and thanks for joining us again today. My name is Saab Johal, and I've worked as a psychologist for 30 years now and as a clinician for 16 of those years. And you can find out more about me if you check out the description for this video. And also you'll be able to find out more about my special guest and collaborator on this series of videos on self-leadership. And that is Julie Trainer. How are you today, Julie? I am very good, Saab, and delighted to be here and uh, looking forward to our chat today. Fantastic. So let's crack straight into it. This is our third discussion in this series. And today we're going to be talking about a once widely talked about personal trait, though it's gone out of fashion in this modern selfie era. And it's a trait characterized by an ability to accurately acknowledge one's limitations and abilities and an interpersonal stance that is other oriented rather than self focused. And that trait is called humility. Now, psychologists have long thought that measuring someone on a scale of just five personality dimensions was enough. That captured everything. And those five are agreeableness, extroversion, neuroticism, conscientiousness, and openness to new experiences. But if we think about the iconic characters in TV that we've seen recently, people like Frank Underwood in House of Cards, or people like Cersei Lannister in Game of Thrones, there's a trait that some of our more memorable villains have in spades, and that is Machiavellianism. Got it right. Mm -hmm. Yet until this, until recently, this has been overlooked by most of personality science. And so it indicates that we perhaps might be missing something. So there has been a development in this and looking at a new personality trait measure, which is supposed to tap into something called honesty, humility. Oh, at either ends of the of the poles of that scale. And it's people who are lacking, perhaps, in these two qualities that these new measures of personality traits are designed to pick out. So, Julie, what's your view on this idea of humility being perhaps missed by a lot of people? And it's perhaps its counterpoint, Machiavellianism, this idea of a group of behaviours that perhaps depicts a person so focused on their own interests that they may manipulate, deceive and exploit others to achieve their goals. Yeah, it's interesting is, you know, if leadership's about anything, it's about who you are as a person and, and what you choose to contribute to the world. So on one hand, you could have uh, people who have humility, who really focus not on themselves, but on other people and then on the other end of the scale, um, you know, Machiavellianism. Now I'm struggling with that, that word. Um, but interestingly, um, Machiavelli wasn't really when he was back in the 15th century and um, considering these issues, it wasn't really about people doing dastardly deals, but he was considering what it takes to be a good politician and a good person at, great, at the same time. And so, you know, for me, what this is really about is grappling with this uncomfortable truth of leadership, which is how do you balance ambition and humility? How do you retain your integrity um, around others who perhaps are playing with less generous motives, let's say? Um, and so in the process, you know, you are trying to weigh up what ethical trade-offs are you trying to make? Um, are you thinking about yourself? Are you thinking about other people? Um, Machiavelli actually talked about something which he called criminal virtues, which in some sense is, is um, a way of behaving which to all intents and purposes looks criminal, but actually is there to protect the greater good. And so if leaders are wanting to stand up for principles or actually getting something achieved, then you have to weigh up this, um, uh, this continuum, if you like, between um, thinking about other people and thinking about yourself. And um, I guess the one thing that comes to mind for me when I think about humility is the extent to which we put leaders on a pedestal and kind of make them out to be heroes of the day um, or superheroes, if you like. Um, and um, in truth, superheroes are the ones that do great things for other people. Um, they are not the ones that are thinking about what's in it for them, but they are really looking to help other people in the process and not get the credit for it. So in one sense, superheroes are the people that really show humility, in my view. But, um, but uh, from a leadership point of view, often people look at leaders and say, we want you to be superhuman. And therefore, in that process, some people lose the focus on other people, they start to think about what they're good at, what they're getting out of it, and therefore that's when you start to get the dastardly people that you've mentioned. And that's where Machiavellianism has really become a little bit uh, corrupted, if you like, um, because it's reflecting that more self 
selfish and self-centered motives. Yeah. As, so that's really where I come from on, on it, on this continuum. That um, it's a it, it's a real fine balance between those two things: ambition, humility, and then where do you meet in the middle? And as you're talking, I'm sat there thinking, I totally agree with you, and I'm wondering about um, this idea of the the pedestal. And this idea of whether the person who is the leader is kind of seeking to put themselves up on a pedestal or whether the team that they're working with is seeking to have them on a pedestal because that's what they need. And I guess that this is leading me to this idea of hubris, this idea, perhaps it's less dark than Machiavellianism, but nevertheless, it's this excessive pride or self-confidence. And we know what that looks like. Yeah, We, get, we see leaders all the time uh, who get caught too caught up in their own success to the point where they're showboating their accomplishments or trying to convince people of their greatness. And the fact is that no one's inspired by show-offs. Bringing about your accomplishments and greatness will most likely result in your team absolutely dissociating and disconnecting with you. Totally. I, I mean, the, the thing is, is that, um, you know, leadership uh, only works when you've got other people following you. And at one level, um, you know, we do look to our leaders to provide confidence and direction and some impotence to what we're doing. But equally, we want our leaders to respect uh, what we're doing, the contribution we're making. Uh, so, yeah, it's interesting how, on one hand, we do want to look up, if you like, or on to leaders on a pedestal, or and actually in hierarchical sense, in many organisations, that literally is where they're going. They seem to be of a higher status. Um, but the truth is, is that we all want to feel uh, important, and we don't like leaders who are pushing themselves as more important than any other human being in that team. Maybe we don't look at the pedestal, we look at the corner office. Maybe that's what we should be doing instead. So I, I just wanted to flag some research that's gone into this concept called intellectual humility, which is defined as an awareness of, actually, it's a reflection on how incomplete or fallible our views might be. Uh, and in particular, we're looking at, I'm looking at this study on political and social issues, people realising that actually perhaps they don't have all the answers. And researchers have found that this kind of intellectual humility is not related to IQ or political affiliation, but it is strongly linked to curiosity, reflection and open mindedness. So we can see how humility can help with leadership and managing oneself. And there's more to that as well. Other people have found that people who score higher for humility are less aggressive and less judgmental towards members of other religious groups that are less than are less humble people, even and especially after being challenged about their own religious views. So they respond well, not only to those other views that people may have, but also when their own views are challenged too. So I wonder, humility is important in leadership too, but also, I guess, relationally, especially when dealing with difficult people, perhaps. Absolutely. Um, one of the um, biggest dilemmas that I work with people on as a coach is how do you have uh, hard conversations to say things to people that um, you know feel tricky to say, but actually also how do you deal with difficult people? And ultimately... Uh, humility comes into play here. And what I say to people is try to be the better person in the room. And they often look at me and quizzically go, well, what do you mean? Um, <clears throat> and I uh, explain this by saying when you feel that somebody is uh, being difficult, if you like, or that uh, their own ethics or motives are being unfairly challenged, showing leadership means that they show humility to the other person. Instead of fighting back, they will have the humility to listen really deeply to what the other person's saying, to be open to another point of view, to have the confidence to challenge what isn't right, um, and also have the wisdom to back down when you need to. And show, showing humility, in my experience, when you are being the better person in the room, it starts to force other people to reflect on their own perspectives, to think about the decisions and actions they're taking, and think about you know that difficult uh, situation that's being... Um, people are trying to work through is that there are two points of view on it. So in effect, um, humility acts as a way of encouraging other people to show more humility uh, because uh, you are being the better person in the room, I can say. And that isn't being um, better in literal sense, but actually you're just creating a space, a space as a leader to allow other people to reflect more deeply, be more curious. And um, it takes the 
uh, difficult and challenge out of the process because you're getting into a much more open dialogue. It is also about compassion because it takes quite a lot of effort sometimes to show compassion in that way because sometimes you just kind of want to shout back and mm. say to the difficult person, you're wrong, you're wrong, when mm. in fact actually humility allows you to um, think a little more deeply, be a bit more open, be a bit more compassionate, and in so doing so you're forcing other people to be a bit more conscientious uh, towards you as well. Hmm. It's a very human point of view, uh, absolutely. I think um, you know, one of the things that I think the research is telling us about humility is that it provides us with a psychological resource, a reservoir for us to be able to perhaps even shake off grudges. Um, perhaps the opposite side of being more compassionate is being actually just be able to suffer fools patiently. You know, even when we know that actually what's being discussed is actually not on the track that um, everybody else has kind of like agreed with, we, we're able to kind of get through that. Um, and also to forgive oneself too, as well, being able to be humble enough to understand that one can make mistakes and being able to move on from that rather than lingering on it. I think one of the things that people su um, suffer with and struggle with is this idea that um, the self-flagellation when people make mistakes and actually the humility to understand that actually you're just like everyone else too uh, and we all make mistakes can, can get us a long way. Yeah, definitely. And I think, uh, you know, one of the best leaders and one of the best leadership traits, I think, is for people to be able to say, I don't know. I've made a mistake. I'm sorry. Uh, that can go an awful long way to diffusing difficult and challenging situations, because often uh, people expect people to continuously hide their vulnerabilities and their mistakes, not own up to um, things that they've done wrong. Um, but it actually is one of the ways that you you can actually kind of in a leadership sense is to, to say, well, look, OK, I was wrong. Now let's talk about it. As opposed to what generally happens is that people are kind of dancing around emotionally to see who can approve each other is right or wrong or make out that one person is better, worse than the other. So for me, um, having the courage to say, you know what, I messed up. And I'm sorry. Um, and so I want to talk to you about whatever else that um, that is going on for you. Uh, it goes a long way uh, because it really shows a depth of humility and humanity towards that other person as well. Hey, if you're still watching, thank you for continuing to stay with us. Please remember to drop us a comment on what you found interesting so far and on your thoughts on how humility can be important in leadership. Now, Julie, I, as we're talking about this, I'm thinking about hubris and how it might serve a purpose in order to, for people to kind of defend against this idea that actually maybe I've made a mistake, maybe I'm not good enough, and where that leads to in people's thought process. And I think this is really linked into how we nurture cult and cultivate humility in ourselves and others, but without diminishing our sense of self-confidence so that we feel so collapsed in that any mistake means and takes us to a really dark place about what we think about ourselves and be more resilient in that space. And I think one of the things that we learned from the research is that it's about the effort. It's about the behavior. It's not necessarily about the person. So paradoxically, to cultivate humility, we need to actually unlink or defuse the personal from the achievement. And one study that I came across in 2013 found that children with low self-esteem often received praise for their personal qualities, for who they were, and that this type of praise can actually trigger greater feelings of shame when there is a failure and may lead to a diminished sense of self-worth. So what we can learn from this and from the research in general that it's actually better to praise the behavior rather than the individual because if you praise the individual and then they fail, it can cause shame and it may inadvertently send the message that you're a bad person. And so it's not so far a leap to hypothesize then that hubris comes from defending against that fear that somehow we might be found out and not being as good at whatever it is that we choose to do and or how we would like to be. We don't want to be seen as a bad person, so we hype up how good we may be for fear of revealing our shame and fear of failure. And I think this is kind of linked into imposter syndrome as well. You know, often we find that those people who actually seem quite big and self-confident, often when you get to know them quite deeply, they reveal this sense of, actually, I don't know what I'm doing and I feel like I'm going to get found out any second. I think it's quite common that this is not far beneath the surface. So what do you think about that in terms of cultivating humility? 
Yeah, it, definitely. The way I think about this is, uh, uh, in a leadership sense, is to say, what are you learning uh, about what's happened? So that you're not, uh, it isn't you're placing an attachment uh, to what's happened in an emotional sense, but you're saying, well, this happened, and what can I learn from it? And then if you want to go deeper, you can say, well, what did I learn from what I learned? So it's it, it really is detaching this personal association. You don't go from this happened, I feel bad that this happened, and therefore it says something that I'm a bad person that this has happened. Um, but it's having humility allows you to interrupt that thought pattern to actually say, well, this happened. Oh, dear, mm. <laughs> that wasn't good. Um, so what do I learn from it? And then what can I learn from what I've learned? So you're taking it one step down, but it takes a lot of self-examination, a lot of self-awareness and self-knowledge to know that you can make the take a difference between your own sense of identity and something that's actually happening. And the bit in the middle is how do you feel about it all? And it's the humility that allows you that space, I think, to be able to say, I am not going to uh, um, make myself a bad person. I'm just going to examine what else I could have done. Um, and that said, it may be times that you do examine what you learned and perhaps you can identify that you were less than generous, perhaps, in a situation um, and that you have to acknowledge that um, you were um, showing some hubris or you were showing even some Machiavellian tendencies. Um, but you need to be able to pull back from that and say, OK, well, what do I learn from that and how do I avoid doing that again in the future? rather than um, just trying to um, hide it away and cover it up and think, well, if nobody else is, if I cover it up, nobody else will notice, because it, actually people do. Hmm. Uh, and that's why they really appreciate humility to say, I made a mistake, I stuffed up, um, and um, we all make mistakes. It doesn't make me a bad person, it just makes me uh, having made an error in this situation. Uh, classic case course is try not to make the same mistake over and over again because that's not really showing too much humility because you're not really learning mm. um, from what's going on. Mm. So as you're talking, I'm thinking about how you, when you said, oh, that didn't go well, I've made a mistake. I guess so that it's talking about quite a few things to me. One is you talked about the feeling and often to be able to step back and defuse and not get caught up by the feeling is really hard and it takes a lot of practice because otherwise we get caught up with the feeling and we act according to the feeling rather than the reflection that we have when we're able to step back from that situation. Mm. And so to be able to interrupt that flow of the feeling and where it leads to, we also need to be aware and interrupt the thought pattern of where that leads to. Because often when we stuff up, when we make a mistake, if we're not careful, we can say, oh, it's me again. It was my fault. It's always my fault. And it's going to affect everything that I do. So there's no point trying anymore because I'm just a mistake. It's not the mistake. I'm the mistake. So yeah, I think being able to actually interrupt that um, uh, linking with the emotion and being caught up with the emotion, but also being aware of our thought patterns, developing that self-awareness and being able to actually step out of that and say, actually, on this occasion, I've made a mistake. I'd like not to do this again. I'd like to get some feedback and get some help from everyone that I'm working with to try to make that not happen again and acknowledge my part in that, but also not let it diminish me and um, limit me so much that I'm not able to perform in my task as a leader. Yeah, totally, totally. It's, it, you know, it's, you know, uh, one example comes to mind, um, which is not necessarily about making a mistake, but sometimes people might be contributing ideas um, to a discussion, solving a problem. And, you know, it's not unusual for somebody to say, that's a terrible idea, that's a bad idea. And it's very easy for us to go, well, that must make me a bad person, mm. as mm. opposed to what was actually being said is the idea wasn't very good but because it's a creative process we are already invested in it because we came up with it and therefore we have an attachment to it um, and so language plays a huge part in the way we influence it and that's where self-coaching uh, if you like that reflection that self-awareness of those feelings and it's like well, well you can choose to recognize the feelings what they are which is oh that feels uncomfortable and that wasn't nice but is that what they really meant um, having the humility to say, um, you know, both to yourself and to other people is like, well, 
okay, it wasn't my greatest idea, <laughs> but I've got plenty more where they come from. Or is what you're saying that I am a person that can't come up with good ideas? Well, of course, people don't, but they say things that they don't mean, if that makes sense. It yeah. is um, really trying to distinguish between um, the literal sense and actually how we interpret that and make uh, make it something that reflects us as a person when, in fact, it actually it's not. Yeah. And so what I'm noticing there is that actually what you're describing here is something that's relational, right? So the person who is actually offering the criticism, the view of the idea, actually what's helpful is that you are specific about that. You say, do you know what? I'm actually not really sure if this idea is going to work that well. And then perhaps you know, even better come up with something that you can do in order to do something instead or to improve it. But really setting a frame, I think, when you're having these kinds of difficult conversations, that it's about the thing. It's not about the people. It's about the ideas. And constantly returning to that as a culture of interaction, I think, then becomes something that could be transformative in, in organisations. Well, that's definitely, and that's ultimately, uh, and this is easier to say than to do, and particularly in the moment and when things are maybe a bit inspiring mm. or, or challenging, is that we all need to show self-leadership. It's not just, you know, that it's sitting in the response of people with the badge on their name. It's that actually we all need to lead ourselves in order that we can all contribute fairly. And therefore, humility is thinking about other people's point of view. Um, and before you uh, kind of spout off, well, that's a bad idea or, or you made a mistake, it's actually having the humility to think, well, um, if that were me, what would it be like for me? And therefore, what might it be like for that person? And how would I rather hear that news or get that feedback in a way that actually doesn't diminish me as a person, but actually values the contribution I made, even if it wasn't a very good idea and it's mm. not going to work. Yeah. So if we move on then, I'm thinking about, well, what can we be doing instead in order to stand in this humble place? I came across a, um, an example from a commencement speech at a high school that I found linked to an article I was reading, and I'll put a link in the description as well. But here's a quote from it I'd like to read out and, and get your thoughts on it. Like accolades ought to be, the fulfilled life is a consequence, a gratifying byproduct. It's what happens when you're thinking about more important things. Climb the mountain not to plant your flag, but to embrace the challenge, enjoy the air and behold the view. Climb it so you can see the world, not so the world can see you. Go to Paris to be in Paris. Not to cross it off your list and congratulate yourself for being worldly. Exercise free will and creative independent thought, not for the satisfactions they bring you, but for the good they will do others, the rest of the 6.8 billion and those who will follow them. And then you too will discover the great and curious truth of the human experience. It's that selflessness is the best thing that you can do for yourself. The sweetest joys of life then come only with the recognition that you're not special because everyone is. <laughs> yeah, I love this. I, you know, if you really stop and think about what not being special means here, it really does force you to um, see yourself as part of this bigger the world. Um, you know, that your ego and your ambitions are just a tiny drop in a bigger world and experience. And it, it really is about stepping back and enjoying the ride, if you like, enjoying mm. the experience. Um, you know, the phrase that often comes to mind is the winning that's important, not, uh, sorry, it's not the winning that's important, it's the taking part that matters. Um, and so to relish the world, to relish the perspective of other people's, to feel the experience, um, is uh, to feel stronger and more powerful um, as a result. Uh, uh, um, and in some senses, is you feel the power by feeling less significant in that respect mm. because you can feel more grateful for the opportunity. You can um, see what it is uh, in terms of uh, in the present moment. Uh, you can learn more. You can open your eyes up because you're not looking uh, for an achievement, you're not looking for whatever you think you've gone to find, whether it's to Paris to climb the Eiffel Tower or do all the uh, tick all the boxes in the you know the tourist trade, um, you know the tourist guide. It is to just get a sense of wow, I'm here, isn't this amazing? Um, and what you can learn and what you can experience is much more deeply that way than um, because yeah, you're just one of many, many, many special things and special people. And actually, it is this powerful sense 
of who you are and what's important to you comes by placing less significance on yourself. Mm. It's hard to do, I think, <laughs> in this world of kind of social proof, bucket lists and, you know, the must-dos and the consumption consumption. Um, but I think people with humility have a real ability to set aside their own point of view and just see the world for what it is um, and see that you're just such a tiny part of a much bigger universe. Mm. And you say it's hard to do. I, I guess one of the things that I've noticed in my life, I've been lucky enough to travel a bit. And so one of the things I've noticed that really brings this home to me is when I'm near mountains or when I'm in the desert, especially when I'm in the desert, a, because I'm, I'm, it's just so big. You can see from horizon to horizon, there's just nothing else there. Uh, and it's just, you're so insignificant. You're, you, your one life is everything because you're there in that moment, but it's also nothing. All the people who have gone before you, all the people that will come, all the people that are around you, you then know your place. And for me, it's about kind of understanding what's my place in this system that I'm working in, the system that I'm living in, this ecology that I'm living in. For me, that's a really good way to, to flick myself into a mode that perhaps promotes a little bit more humility. So, and I guess what I'm bringing us to is this idea is uh, if we want to lead with humility, what are the sorts of things that we should be looking to do? What are the sorts of behaviors that exemplify humility? Because it's kind of, a, I guess it's an iterative process, right? It feeds itself. You know, the, the more that you behave in a humble way, the more benefit and feedback you get from how useful that is and the more you're likely to behave in that way in, in the future. Mm. So I guess I'll take you through maybe five things that we've kind of like nailed down here. And Julie, I'd, I'd love to get your views on each one as we go through it and perhaps I'll add to that. The first one is um, sounds really obvious, sounds like something that we should be doing anyway, but I'd be interested to hear what you think the, the particular angle on humility is here, and that is to promote and acknowledge others. Oh, de uh, definitely. And I think it plays not just to actual people uh, that, you know, uh, people with humility are good at recognizing um, and promoting the contribution of others and respecting their value. But I think it plays back to what we were just saying is that we are a very tiny piece of a very big universe over a very long period of time. And so actually acknowledging that is another way of showing humility. Um, you're not necessarily spotlighting yourself, but you're actually giving credit either to the universe or the world or the circumstances in which you find yourself or other people. So it's giving credit where credit's deserved. And that's mostly, um, you know, other people or other things. It makes you uh, bring a great deal of perspective around actually who you are uh, and also recognizes the perspective that other people bring as well, I think. Mm. I guess just a little side note here is that I don't want, I guess, people to get the idea that we don't think that achievements are important or that getting tasks done is not important. But I guess one of the things that's coming out of this discussion is that actually they're a byproduct of all the other things that we have to do in order to kind of harness the talents uh, and opportunities that we have throughout the whole team. And that can only really be unlocked by taking a step back, understanding your position. And that takes a, a humble approach and humility in that. So the second one here is being collaborative. How does being collaborative exemplify humility? Well, I think to some extent it plays a little bit of what you've just said, um, to me anyway, about um, uh, achieving, uh, achieving things. Um, because for me, you um, mostly get more and better outcomes and achievements by working with other people. Um, whether you're working on the team or whether you are working on your own and then you get feedback and input and help from other people to be able to create a product or produce something or create something in the world. It comes through a collaborative effort. And humility is to recognize that, uh, A, that you can't do it on your own. And secondly, that um, by collaborating with others, you're going to get much bigger perspective, lots of diversity and more creativity. And the fact that collaboration is not ju just not for your own benefit, um, but actually by you collaborating, you're helping other people as well. So for me, collaboration is important, not just to produce great results, but actually it's the way that you can um, uh, help other people in a way. So it's not all about you by collaborating with others. They're collaborating with you and it's this kind of virtuous cycle, if you like. I guess one of the things that uh, I've seen in teams is that um, 
that one needs to watch out for is this idea of when you're being collaborative is that you're treating the whole team as equals. That's not saying that everyone is the same. But if we're not careful, then if we've got a tight deadline, we focus our coaching perhaps on those people who we see as deliverers who are going to be able to get the job done. And then that becomes reinforced and we end up just spending and pouring all our resource into those members of the team rather than, than other members of the team who perhaps contribute in other more silent, invisible ways. So really thinking about what does collaboration actually mean? It's not perhaps just about the task that needs to get done in the short term. It's promoting a longer view around that and being humble enough to see that actually my place is to kind of try to uh, facilitate that happening across the whole team, not just certain members. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and the collaboration is only the process to get a better contribution mm. and to create the space for other people to, to contribute well. So if you are leading a team, for example... Um, is to make sure that everybody um, feels safe and able to make that contribution. But also is being a member of a team, not just to hang back and let other mm. people take the strain. Um, uh, for you not to sit in your comfort zone, but actually to actually contribute. Um, you know, collaboration in some senses has become a bit of a passive thing. Oh, yeah, we're all collaborate. We can sit together and chat about it. But, you know, actually it's humility that actually gets us to step up and contribute mm. uh, to that collaboration, not just be part of it as it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's easy just to kind of like be the, uh, if we're not careful, to loaf around in, uh, in a particular task when something's happening. It's called social loafing. I don't necessarily like the term, but it's easy to kind of take a back seat and, pass and be passive. It was actually being humble is about, well, what can I contribute here, even though perhaps I'm not the person who has the knowledge in order or the skills to get this done, in what other ways can I contribute and what other ways can I learn perhaps in this process where then next time this comes up, I can then contribute in a different Definitely. way. Yeah. Yeah. So the third one here is um, showing integrity. Now, I'd love to get your view on this because I'm sure you must come across this lots and lots. Oh, uh, definitely. And, um, you know, I've done many exercises with both individuals and teams of people um, where we're talking about values and the importance of honesty and integrity. Um, and it's really fascinating how people can spend a long time thinking deeply about, you know, what matters to them and then um, completely uh, avoid uh, upholding those values and showing the integrity to them. You know, it's a case of um, saying what you mean and, and doing, um, doing what you say you're going to do, you know, keeping promises and recognising that um, honesty and integrity means um, following through. Uh, it's not about saying, oh, that's a nice thing for us all to have and then go, oh, but it's too hard. Mm. Uh, humility is actually to embrace uh, what you decide is most important, particularly in a team or even to yourself, and follow through. Um, I work with teams, and when I do, um, I try to get them to talk. When they start to talk about integrity, you know, I start to talk about work ethic, mm. and they sometimes start to realise that, whoa, hang on a minute here. Um, uh, you know, if we are going to have a work ethic, what does that mean? And so, you know, it's showing integrity by upholding what you believe in and following through even if from time to time you slip it's to be able to say oops they're um having the humility to go well i didn't do that or i didn't follow through on that but um but showing integrity to me is one of the most fundamental things that's important to individuals and teams and certainly in teams the moment integrity starts to slip and slide either as individuals in a team or the team as a whole um, that's when I think you start to erode trust and you start to erode um, commitment. Um, so integrity for me is the foundation upon, upon which leadership is built because it sets the standards, if you like, by which you, are, you as an individual or a team are expected to uphold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, what you've described here is I, I would sum up as this idea of alignment, You know, this idea of you say what you're going to do and you do it and you repeat it and you keep going doing that. And when you stuff up, you own it and you talk about it. You understand how that happened and you don't want to do that again. And then you carry on trying to say what you're going to do and then delivering upon what it is that you said you were going to do. It's quite simple, difficult to do. It is. And, and I think, you know, part of that as well is holding other people to account so, mm. you know, in a work setting or even a family or, or friendships or relationships. It is to be able to have the courage to say, hey, you know, 
you said this, but you did that. What's going on there? It's mm. having the humility not to be too judgmental about it, mm. but it's having the courage to say, you know, that's not right. Mm. Um, and uh, I'm calling you out on it. Mm. So, yeah, perhaps related to that then is this idea of the fourth idea is being appreciative. Uh, so what, what does that mean to you in humility, Julie? Well, I think being uh, appreciative is uh, being um, showing other people that you value them. Uh, we all need to feel value. We all need to have status and worth. We all need to feel reward. In fact, the brain um, is encoded to look for reward um, emotionally and cognitively because it's that that allows us to grow in confidence and give more. So if we don't feel appreciated, if we don't get acknowledgement, um, so whether it's at work or at home, you know, we all know what it's like when you kind of feel like you're slogging away and not getting any thanks at all. And it's not that you need to lots of loud applause or, or, or prizes, although they can be quite nice if you enjoy that kind of thing. But a symbol appreciation, a thank you, hmm. um, can be good enough to improve your level of confidence and therefore uh, make you feel like you have more status and self-worth, uh, let alone in a team where you're actually uh, are actually demonstrating value by contributing to the success of the team. Mm. And without appreciation, whether it's from the leader or from other members of the team, it can feel quite isolating um, and can not feel that good. Mm. And, I, and I think here, you know, one of the things that underlies this is this difference between being others-oriented and self-oriented and striking the balance between the two. And it strikes me that perhaps a leader with humility will always be grateful rather than prideful because it's about being the gratitude is about understanding what it is that's contributed to your success, the team's success. But being prideful is where the spotlight is then back on you. I'm proud because this is what I've done uh, for my team. This is what I, my leadership has done in order to produce this. So there's a, there's a big difference, I think, between that grateful stance and the prideful stance. Yeah, definitely. And also between the prideful uh, stance in in um, helping other people to find pride in what they're doing as well um, by showing appreciation towards them, um, and that doesn't mean to say you all have to kind of exhibit hubris, but it, but it is a much gentler, more humble, uh, you know, form of appreciation uh, where humility is actually the way to doing that. Yeah, and that's not to say that having pride is bad, but it uh, needs to be struck with, with the balance of great gratitude yeah. too. Yeah. And so the final one, and I, I know that this is core to your purpose, Julie, and that's being human. To show humanity is a key to humility and leadership. Yeah, definitely. And, and if anything, if I think anything about uh, leadership and self-leadership is to recognize that we're not perfect. Um, that as humans, we have faults, we have limitations, we have strengths, we have great uh, characteristics as well. Um, but, um, but we don't always function in a perfect way, in a perfect world. Uh, we bring a lot of emotional baggage with us everywhere that we're going on. There's always stuff going on. There's always experiences from the past. And when you show up um, with uh, humanity, it is to show compassion towards yourself and humility towards yourself and other people. I think too often, certainly in a formal leadership sense, uh, in an organizational setting, I think we try to be too idealistic about the way we operate. When we show humanity, we show that we're a human being and therefore um, we're more likely uh, to accept ourselves and for other people to accept us as well. So, yeah, for me, uh, leadership is all about being human, working with your strengths and those weaknesses and not trying to be perfect uh, or even think that anybody can be perfect. It's much better to recognize that we have warts and all and uh, enjoy them for what they are. Thank you, Julie. It's been brilliant talking with you again today. Uh, please let us know in the comments below what you thought, what resonated with you, what did you agree or disagree with? Do you have any tips for those who find themselves wondering how to manage to stay humble yet also maintain their self-confidence and indeed perhaps assertiveness when needed? And perhaps that's something we can talk about in another show. Now, have you done this yourself? How did you manage it? We'd love to hear your stories. Now, we hope to be back again soon and we hope you'll join us again then too. Until then, thanks again, Julie. You've been brilliant as always. Uh, love, love chatting with you and I'll see you again soon too. Cheers. Thanks very much, Sarbi. It's going great. Thanks. Bye now.